So I love every one of my clients and I think to do this work, you need to, but this particular client and this particular set of circumstances went pretty far to illustrating all of the things that I think make my approach to turnaround, restructuring, and business transformation more impactful. And I mean, just a little bit to go to get into that, your yes. uh, theory or your practice, your way of doing a uh, working from a turnaround perspective is a little bit different from other turnaround companies and specialists that go in as business consultants. Tell us That's absolutely that. right. So, so the Abraxas group approach is multi-pronged, but it kind of boils down to, I don't sell time and I don't bring in any junior people. So an Abraxas group engagement is one designated change agent who takes a C-level executive position, designs and implements the plan, and stays with the company through the implementation of the plan, makes sure that the team is upskilled, and then hires their replacement and leaves. So that tends to counsel a longer engagement, but a much more holistic engagement in that the change agent is a formal member of the executive team. And when it's time to depart, rather than in the leveraged model where you could have as many as half a dozen consultants all leaving at the same time, you have one person leaving who has distributed and managed the work with the in-house staff. Mm -hmm. We're very focused on not only driving change and driving measurable change, but ensuring that that change is sustainable going forward. Perfect. Let's get into it. Absolutely. So I'm a big fan of quotes, and I like to start most of my presentations with a quote. I found a good one from William Tecumseh Sherman, one of the, one of the lead generals on the Union side in the US Civil War. He noted that the legitimate object of war is a more perfect peace. And to me, this encapsulates everything that a business transformation is. We are not just seeking to end the need for transformation. We're seeking to get to a new and more stable equilibrium in which the company does not anymore need to go through something so wrenching. The, the goal is to overshoot the to overshoot the symptoms of the problem and essentially fix the root cause. And that, that thesis, that um, through line is absolutely something I hold very dear to myself and something I carry with me to every engagement. Wonderful. So this client is a second generation family owned manufacturer of ethnic hair care products based in the Chicago metro area. They had experienced a decade of declining sales and catastrophic market share losses, which had led to a cascading series of operating losses, which were no longer sustainable. The company suffered from poor financial controls and a lack of strategic direction, and it had been unable to chart a course of change internally. At the end of 2019, the owners, along with their trusted advisors, made the determination that they needed an outside professional to come in and not only advise on, but design and implement a way forward. 
Now, this is very much in keeping with what I see with my clients. There is a, a very pronounced progression in turnaround and distressed situations. A company starts to underperform. The incumbent management team seeks to address that. Some subset of those approaches are unsuccessful. They bring in the first wave of advisors. Those advisors usually have direct connections or are uh, members of the advisory groups and advisory firms that the company already has relationships with. That doesn't work. Then the management team will look a little bit further afield and generally do some light, bring in a performance improvement expert or experts. Often those engagements are are too tightly controlled and too, too focused on specific silos and therefore are unsuccessful. They may bring in a transaction advisor to look to see if incremental financing or even a sale could solve their problem. If for some reason a capital market solution is not tenable, either because the, the cost of debt is too high because of the company's underperformance or the company is not able to command the sale price that the owners, uh, the owners deem necessary, they then look to people like me people who fix the company. It's regrettable that there are those steps because value is lost at every one of those steps, but it's also critically important in what I do that there is a meeting of the minds. There has to be an acceptance of the fact that the status quo is unsustainable and substantial change must happen. And especially with family owned companies, there has to be an embracing of the reality that the outside change agent is going to be empowered to make many of those changes. When you have those pieces in place, you, you start to have the elements of a very successful turnaround, restructuring or business transformation. And I imagine since that takes time, for them to come around to that that mentality and finally get to that point, that pain point that brings you along, right? Um, when you come in, what is the biggest challenge in getting them to be on the same page with you? The biggest challenge is to reorient the the team of decision makers. With family owned companies very frequently, simply the family members. With private equity backed companies and with a nonprofits, you see a, a different mix of decision makers, but family owned companies, first through third generation, you are often talking to direct family members of the founder. It's crucially important that they embrace where they are right now. And by embrace, I don't mean enjoy it, but they need to accept it. The acceptance of the objective, strategic, and financial reality of the company is the building block for all that's going to come afterwards. If you can't acknowledge that one more year, like the last five, will kill us, then you're not going to go anywhere. If in the back of your mind you think, well, you know, we'll be fine for another three years, then, then you're not on the same page. But once everyone gets on the same page with, this is bad, this has been bad. David and Abraxas Group aren't blaming anyone. It's not my job to blame people, but it is my job to lay out the objective facts. You can't take another year like this. You can't take another two years like this. This is how much the last few years have cost you. And we need to stop that trend here, now, this year. When you get an embrace of that mindset, you, you start on the road to transformation. 
Wonderful. So as I said, this company had experienced steep revenue declines. Now you'll see that on this exhibit, 2015 is keyed in as 100. So you see that the revenue had declined by over 25% in just a five year period. And for anyone who's ever been involved with a manufacturer, they will know that it is very hard to continue to ratchet down your cost structure in the face of those revenue declines. Market share erosion was even worse than the revenue decline. This due to the fact that the market was growing, whereas this client was, the, the market, the rate of the market was not only growing, but it was accelerating. And this client was continuing to see a downward trend in revenue, which resulted in the company's market share being a third of what it had been at the start of the decade. That looks very painful. It, it was incredibly painful. And thank you for mentioning that because I think that's an element that some of my peers don't focus on enough. I started my career as an entrepreneur. There is an emotional component of this, especially for a family owned company that has to be addressed. It, it's embarrassing. It's hurtful. You know, very often you, in the face of these declines, in the face of this negative performance, you've had to let go of friends. You've had to get together at family gatherings that, have, that are no longer joyous. It is, it is not just a professional or a financial hit. It's almost a psychic and emotional hit. And the, the thing that can be so rewarding about working with family-owned companies is that when you engage with them at that level, they appreciate it and they're so much more responsive. It's absolutely a business. It's meant to make money, but you have to recognize the emotional truth that for the family, it's often a lot more than that. And a family business in decline is very often causing significant hardship within the family that goes far beyond the financial. Those revenue declines and those market share declines were leading to persistent and unsustainable losses. Now, you will see that the losses as a percentage of revenue were starting to moderate, but in no way were sustainable. Also, due to the amount of time that the company had lost money, the cumulative losses were simply growing to horrendous proportions, really reducing the company's financial flexibility and necessitating a change as soon as possible. And then to rub salt in the wounds, the company's two largest competitors, which had been a fraction of the company's own market share at the start of the decade, were now a combined seven times the market share of the company. So we knew who was eating our lunch, and the company, unfortunately, at that point was powerless to address that issue. I started my career, my formal career, in turnaround and restructuring, working at two middle market firms. And the training I got was invaluable. One of the lessons that I took into a Braxis group and how we approach our, our service delivery model is I always start with an assessment. And to me, an assessment is a limited time frame, tightly defined scope engagement in which there will be a clear 
objective assessment of a number of elements that will lead to the development of a thesis for fixing the business. No client who hires a Braxis group for an assessment needs to go any further. Our, our assessment reports stand alone, but they are designed to be a building block and a roadmap for further change. In this case, the assessment looked at four key areas. We took a hard look at the strategy. What strategy was the company pursuing and what strategy might be successful given the information that we had right now? We took a hard look at the team and I'm going to get back to that in uh, shortly, but I pride myself on our focus on the team, on morale, and the people side of a business transformation. We spend a lot of time on that, especially in an assessment. And I said the team and morale, because even though I, I break those out as two points, they're, they're really very tightly correlated. And then we're looking for discrete levers. There should be a small number of areas of improvement that should be focused on. Is that your low-hanging fruit? Absolutely. But, um, but even beyond that, you want to make sure that you are not focusing on too many areas of opportunities. You want a handful of high opportunity areas that you can focus on. The reason being, after years of underperformance, the, the company is out of practice with change. It's my job to come in and help catalyze change, lead from the front, but I wouldn't be successful if I came in and said, we are going to change these 10 things all at once. You need to come in very focused and say, these are the handful of things that we're going to attack. This is the order that we're going to attack them. And we've done the analysis. We understand what we expect will be the results from fixing this thing, and then this thing, and then this thing. And that type of staging essentially creates a you're trying to create a virtuous cycle. You're trying to get to the point that one win creates a morale boost and creates excitement that makes the next win easier, that makes the next win easier. And then at some point, you don't have to lead the next change initiative. You're coaching it from the back and you're continually making the organization stronger while broadening the front of change. Mm -hmm but it all starts with a very focused approach. As you said, the low hanging fruit, a limited number of levers. And I imagine that that helps in building confidence in the management team and start building up the, that affects the morale, having these small wins to begin with and then building on those. It, it absolutely does. One of the, one of the challenges with, catalyzing change in an organization is I, I like to refer to it as the the 15 70 15 15 percent of the staff are with you from day one they have notebooks full of ideas they've been talking with their friends they know exactly what they would change if they could and they are pretty detailed about those things those are my shock troops. Those people are with me from the day I walk in the door. 70% are persuadable, but they're not there. And 15% will never be with you. The, the old regime has worked too well for them. They are not interested in changing. They view the problem as being elsewhere. I'm doing my job. If those departments would just do theirs, we would be fine those people probably won't make it, but they're never going to get on board. My job is to go from the 15% that I have from the time that I walk in the door to 
adding that 70%. If I've got 85% of the company, I won the game and we've turned around the company. And that's how I approach it. In this particular assessment with a company that had 180 employees, the day I walked in the door, I had one-on-one -on -one interviews with 52 of them in a three week period. This was before COVID, so all of these interviews were in person. Now, the, the, time, the timing for these interviews varied. Some were as short as 30 minutes, some were as long as two hours, but there were only three questions that I was looking to ask. The rest was just a free form conversation. And those questions are, what are the company's greatest strengths? What are the company's greatest weaknesses? And what does an outsider need to know about the company? Again, this is all, the assessment is predicated on building the foundation, developing a thesis for a successful business transformation. So this is invaluable information going forward. What, what we saw was not at all surprising. Greatest strengths, family business, and the products. Okay, that makes sense. Greatest weaknesses, communication and a fear of change. Also not shocking, but very good to know. The need to know question is probably my favorite because different people interpret it differently, but invariably they give me little nuggets that are just crucial. You need to know that it's a family business to understand it. That tells me there are some idiosyncrasies in this company that I need to watch out for. And you need to know that it's resistant to change. Okay, that tells me something too. And, and to your point earlier, that's going to inform how I look at my levers for change because I know that there is that resistance. I know not to go out and look for the look to pick a fight by picking the hardest thing to change or the most dearly held conviction to upend up front. And it's funny how I would think in family owned businesses, I think that would be like the biggest challenge overall. It, it can be a real challenge. And unfortunately, one of, the, one of the challenges that my profession has had has been too often my profession comes in with very sharp elbows and they simply dictate, this is the way it has to be. I found that to be a very ineffective way to drive lasting change. You can certainly be a bull in a china shop for a few months if everyone is convinced that the company is in very dire straits, but you can burn a lot of goodwill and you run the risk of the company backsliding significantly when you leave if you don't take the time to understand the company and drive change that is in keeping with how the company views itself. There's the objective bottom line result of a turnaround or a business transformation should be improved business fundamentals, but how you get there is the art of it. And it's to me, it's very important to get there in a way that the company will not reject those changes after you leave. So after the interview, uh, an employee survey was distributed to the vast majority of employees. We missed a few, but it was very revealing that 85% of questions had a negative average sentiment score. So of 40 questions that, we, that were asked to probably about 120 employees, 34 of those questions had a negative average score. That was worrisome. It, it told me that morale had been beaten down pretty low. It told me that while people were hopeful for change, 
they weren't believing that it was possible. And that started us down the road of making the change. So on January 13th of 2020, the company retained me as its interim chief operating officer with a mandate to validate the thesis that was developed in the assessment and to turn around the organization. On my third day at the company, I, what, we organized a town hall. Again, this was pre-COVID, so we were still doing in-person town halls. The CEO gave me a, a, very, a very nice introduction and I made it clear to the employees that my job was to return the company to profitability that year. Now remember, this is a company that had not seen substantial profitability for over a decade, that had not seen any profitability for I believe seven years. So it's important to put a stake in the ground. Not we're going to get there at some point, not we're going to be better this year than last, we're going to be profitable this year. He said that on January 15th in front of well over 100 witnesses. Mm -hmm. It's about the power of the crowd observing the crowd. I wanted everyone to see and hear what I had just said, and I wanted them to see and hear that their peers saw and heard it. So everyone knew that I was committed. Everyone knew that the management team was committed. What is the metric of success? At the end of 2020, there has to be black ink. Took about three weeks to validate the initial thesis that was developed in the assessment report. Some slight modifications were made, and then that business transformation plan was presented to the owners and approved that day for immediate implementation. That business transformation plan had three elements. Focus on efficient operations, drive continuous improvement, and foster communication and collaboration across all stakeholders. Not only break down the silos within the organization, but create a much more free-flowing level of communication with our outside partners. It's important in driving change and in finding levers of change to make sure that you have good solid tracking and a process for change that is repeatable. In this case, we defined every change, every discrete element of change as a change initiative. And we laid out a process that worked pretty well for us. We start with identifying the opportunity, then we create a working group, we develop an implementation plan, we implement and we monitor performance. And the wheel continues to turn. Again, it's about creating a virtuous cycle. And over a period of now about 21 months, we have driven literally dozens of strategic change initiatives across continuous performance, efficient operations, communicate and collaborate, governance, and of course, coronavirus response. So we're very proud of this approach and it's worked very well. It's helped us organize our approach to change. And also this gives the company a roadmap going forward. This approach to change will persist beyond my tenure, which is something that I'm very proud of. Well, I imagine that this way of doing it, you kind of created a, uh, a, a, a way of, of a strategic way of implementing change for them that they learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in, in, in what I do, there is often a little bit of <laughs> a little bit of animosity between um, 
consultants and advisors who consider themselves change management experts and turnaround and restructuring people. To me, I focus on business transformation. And the way I look at that is we are all on a spectrum of changing organizations. And I look at change management and performance improvement as the relatively early stages. The change does not have to be as severe. By the time you get to turnaround, you are making substantial changes in an organization, but often without a robust strategic framework. Uh, restructuring is often a balance sheet focus change that is not implemented by the leadership of the company. They're implemented in concert with the leadership, but it's generally your capital markets advisors. To me, a business transformation encompasses all of those elements and takes it a step further by weaving in a new strategic vision that is going to encompass those changes. How do I win going forward? I view what I do as writing the first few chapters of the next 10 years of my clients. You lost money before, then you brought me in and we invested in change together. Now we're writing the, we're writing the next book, we're writing the next chapter for your next step in growth and profitability. No company made it through 2020 without responding in force to COVID-19 and how it impacted their business. We looked at four measures. Our cost structure, luckily, we were well underway with cost structure changes when COVID became the emergency that it became in the United States. So our cost structure changes on top of that were relatively modest, a few temporary layoffs, and we brought most of those people back. We did develop a staffing matrix in case it was necessary to shut down. Luckily for us, it never was. We developed and rolled out a contact tracing protocol so that when any of our colleagues got sick, there was a staff announcement approach that we activated immediately, depending on where that person was working. We, we had a stat, uh, contact tracing checklist. We were very happy with that. Luckily, we did not have too many positives, but we did have a few. And everyone seeing that we had an approach made everyone feel a little bit better. And we certainly took advantage of the PPP loan opportunity for round one we did not qualify for round two because we had a good year. I said before that I committed myself in my first week very publicly to a crystal clear objective measure of success. And we knocked the cover off the ball with that. Not only did we achieve profitability for the first time since 2013, we reversed over a decade of revenue losses by showing positive year-over-year -year growth. Gross profit was up substantially. We took the break-even point down nearly 12%. Revenue per case was up, and our, some of our key operating metrics Order fill rate was considerably up and back order rate was considerably down. We were making more money and doing better in our core operations by the end of 2020 than we had done in a very long time. Perhaps most impressively to me, in 2020, we drove the adjusted EBITDA margin, an improvement of 10 percentage points. I'm most proud of this because it moves away from the turnaround mindset of I saved the company. First, 
we saved the company. I don't do anything. I catalyze the change. But not only did the, was the company saved, 2020 was quite possibly the chief value creation year in the company's history. That change from persistent negative profitability to robustly positive profitability vastly increases the universe of potential buyers and vastly increases the value that the company could command on the open market. We created millions of dollars of equity value for the owners in the course of this change. That's awesome. Thank you. And very, very dramatic. Yes, yes, very, uh, very compelling. A 10 percentage point improvement in margin in, in a year is not something you see very often. <laughs> would would you have projected did you really think that you were going to get to this kind of uh, profitability improvement in the first year i definitely had a robust turnaround thesis and i definitely saw levers to pull to drive change but the the change did outstrip my early projections and it did outstrip uh my expectations and the reason for that, I, I very strongly believe, is the amount of time and attention I spent on focusing on the team dynamics, understanding morale, and seeking to continue to build the capability of the company throughout the year. There, I let everyone know that you might have a good idea that we're going to act on, but our plate is full. So don't lose hope. Your, you've got your idea down, but right now we're working on these three. So help me get these three done so we can get to yours. Everyone knew that they were part of what was going on. We reported things rigorously and in detail and repeatedly. We continued to let people know what, what was working and what wasn't. And I think that's key. It's it's dangerous, it's a trap and a turnaround to only report the good news and not the bad news. That's what was happening before. The first casualty of any distressed situation is honest communication. So what we committed ourselves to doing is the team is going to get good news and bad because they can help us fix the bad news and they need to understand the good news as well. They need to understand these changes you're making, these sacrifices you're making, they led us to this performance. And if we can get another 5%, this is where we can go. And these things that are holding us back, this is where we need your help. It's, it's so important to get everyone on board. There is a temptation when the, the business dynamics are grim to start pushing people out of the way and to get out of the way i know what needs to be done but you miss all of the nuance when you do that mm -hmm. and you don't have people on board with you that's a path to saving a company but it's not a path to fixing a company yeah. and i also think that the, we fix companies right i also think it's an advantage that you're there hands-on every day absolutely Absolutely. And though there's an interim in front of my title, there is, there is no discernible difference. I'm there. I've got direct reports. In this case, I owned, I oversaw four departments. I was in the trenches with everyone day in and day out doing it. And that does help. It really does. And this is me. Mm -hmm. Should anyone be interested? <laughs> <laughs> no, but what do you think uh, once you do wrap this up with this with this company, what do you think is a lasting impression that you're gonna have of them? So uh, I, I mentioned earlier, and in all honesty, it's true. I fall in love with every one of my clients. I've never had a client where I have not come away fascinated by the business, and enthralled that I met those people 
even, even the ones who caused some heartache. I think my biggest takeaway from this experience is going to be, I feel that the service delivery model that Abraxas Group has been working on is really coming into tight focus here. We created so much value. We saved about 140 jobs. We created a path for the company going forward. And I think a lot of that had to do with how we approached the situation. And I'm going to continue to develop and refine that approach. It's not for everyone, but for companies, for business owners, and for trusted advisors who are looking for more than just saving a company, just fixing a balance sheet, but fundamentally, improving a business going forward, I think we've got something to offer. Mm-hmm. Going for the long term in the in that sense instead of just going for the short fix. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean here you laid down the foundation for 10 years. Yes. No. Yes, very much so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think that you changed their mentality in terms of planning? Is it I, business? I think I did. And I think that a big part of it to me is making sure that everything that I leave behind when I walk out the door is intelligible and people understand how I got there. So this company, when I walk out the door, is not only going to have, I'm now in my my second year at the company, is not only going to have two years of robust and profitable performance, two years of positive year-over-year sales growth and operating metrics improvements, but it's going to have, it has, its first five-year strategic plan in its history. We've hired, I recruited and onboarded the company's first chief financial officer. We have brought on a new head of HR. It's a different company. And that's the key thing. That's the key with a distressed company. You have to recognize how severely negative the status quo is, and you have to build brick by brick to fix it. Mm -hmm. By the time I leave, I believe we will have done enough, built up enough structure, trained up enough people, brought in enough new people, that we will have a fundamentally different business, even though the ownership didn't change. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Wow. Well, David, thank you so much for this amazing case study. And uh, I'm sure that the listeners and and everyone coming on board to see this will be challenged uh, in terms of their thinking and, and positioning as we're looking at turnarounds in business. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your time.